Let's pray about this message. Father, as we see a side of you today in your word, it is, uh, to be quite honest, a bit terrifying, Lord. And I don't know that we always think of you in this light or maybe even in the darkness, Lord. And that perhaps we lose a sense of reverence at times for your high holy character. I pray, God, that may it never be with the people of God. Father, that your word is given to remind us again that you are, yes, the God of love, but you are also a mighty God and a perfect and just God who will execute justice upon the wicked. And Lord, I, where we see ourselves intersect with this thing called faith and the great grace of God, I pray that we are encouraged that even dead in our trespasses, Lord, you have given us a great grace and mercy. You have brought us to life. Father, I pray for this message today as we enter a new territory for us as a congregation, as we engage with Exodus, Father. I thank you for the word given through all generations that we might know the wonder of the one called God and the great and mighty works you've done. I pray for this congregation, those who might hear this message. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. If you have a copy of God's holy word, we will be in Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 to 9. Now I'll be uh, teaching the, uh, the Ten Commandments, but we'll get into this here. Exodus chapter 19 as a background for our text over the next few months. Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 to 9. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported these words to the people of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the, of the people to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as we embark in a several month long journey in our study of the Ten Commandments, I felt it to be a good measure that we ought to step back a little bit before and set the background because it's grand. That we ought to spend perhaps even several weeks in that background. Today we're going to focus in on verses 1 to 9. We'll move through Exodus 19 and in a few weeks we'll come into the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. This is the background of God giving the law. It was the exodus from Egypt that sets the Mosaic Covenant into motion. And that, my friends, was the sole working of our great God in this establishment of a people who would be given a divine revelation directly from God in the Ten Commandments. Now, throughout the Mosaic Law, all of what it is, God would use Moses as his intermediator or his mediator to the people. Between God and the people, Moses was his chosen agent. A key to understanding the larger Mosaic Covenant and its law 
that would be given is the grace that God delivered his people from the land of Egypt. That's where it all began. God did that for them. God had done, in a sense, he'd already done the mighty work. And this law given is what God would require of a people who would live in his presence, a people who had been set free by God. None of it was negotiable. None of the terms were negotiable. For God had fixed the law given because the law itself is meant to be a reflection of the high and holy character of God. Yet they had been an enslaved people and God would require their obedience to the law. And they had been saved and delivered by the grace of God. He had already given it to them, not because of their works or even their obedience but because God is merciful and God fulfills his very word given. That, the word, by the way, in the previous covenant that he'd given to Abraham in the establishment of the people, he is fulfilling every word of it. And rather than nullifying the earlier covenants, in fact, it was strengthening that covenant through the Mosaic law, whereby God revealed with greater clarity his intentions, his full intentions. And it was here that God's deliverance of the people, that we, we would begin to see his fulfilling of these promises given to Abraham. For through the law and through Abraham, this giving of this law, in particular the Ten Commandments, and this blessing he'd given to Abraham, the nations would be blessed, even though his own people were unable to keep the law. We're going to look at three key lessons today in verses 1 to 9. And the very first lesson we will encounter is that God to give them this law must first prepare people to receive the law. He's going to prepare them to do that. Secondly, he's going to give us the elements of the preparation. That'll be in verses three to eight. And in verse nine, we see a fearsome coming of God. That's the third thing in a thick cloud. But let's take a look at God preparing a people, preparing a people to live in a covenant relationship. Can you imagine living in the actual proximity of God the Father guiding you by day and night, that God might dwell in their midst? Ligon Duncan, J. Ligon Duncan, he said this, he said, you know, they're going to wander in the wilderness for another 38 years after this. And isn't it interesting, friends, he said that of those 38 years, we're only told a very small amount of the books. And Moses, but of these 11 months, he said, you know what we get? We get Exodus 19, Leviticus, and Numbers through chapter 10, all packed into this, into this area. These 11 months are less than 1 40th of their entire time in the wilderness, but they occupy the focus of and from Exodus 19, 4 through Leviticus and Numbers chapter 10. And he asked, he said, why do you suppose long stretches of the history of Israel in the wilderness are skipped over and there's all this focus on the meeting and Duncan answers that quite rightly because it is the law of God that is given here in particular the Ten Commandments that is given that defines this great covenant this distinctive of God's covenant with Moses it is the law given that defines the covenant it is the law given to a people who have been delivered from great oppression and so we read verses 1 and 2 again on the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, that great grace is done. On that day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, and they set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain. It was this location that God had foreordained that Moses should receive the law, and to receive this law contained in the covenant, God would prepare the people to dwell there with him. Therefore, God leads them to this place, this mountainous region. And it would be there that he begins to prepare their hearts. He knows what lies ahead for them. Forty years is what's going to lie ahead for them. God's going to prepare them for this entire 40 years. And then, and then the few that would be allowed then to cross over the Jordan in a future time because he'll give them the law again at a later date in Deuteronomy. God preparing a people for a great blessing. And this is all very remnant of, reminiscent of John the Baptist when he's told to make ready a people prepared for the Lord in the final covenant, the new covenant that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The people of that day were not ready for a visitation from God and John was charged to prepare them through this baptism, make ready a people prepared. 
But God's work here is far more than leading his people to the desert and saying, well, here's the book. Let me just drop it in your lap. There's far more going on than that. Our God is the great God of order, and he will uphold his great and holiness and his great sense of order that lifts up his high and holy nature. And so God unfolds these events, these events for us in the way that we see here in verses 3 to 8. And the very first of these is God preparing his people. He gives them these four elements in this next section. And the first is that God summons Moses as a king would summon a subject. The summoning of Moses by our high God is Moses being summoned by God, our great king. And I'll be honest with you, I'm glad. Can you imagine Moses being summoned to the mountain that day? The fear that must have been in the dread of Moses. There in verse 3, we read this. While Moses went up to God, the, the, the Lord called him. When, when Moses went up to God, the Lord called out to him. And he called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel. Now, in the ancient Near East, there's a type of arrangement that happens with kings and lesser nations, greater nations and lesser nations. This is called a suzerain vassal treaty. And we see a form of it happening here, a form of international relationship where one nation, a vassal, a lesser nation, will pay tribute to a suzerain, a greater nation. And we see this sometimes with Israel and Egypt, or later Israel and the Greeks, and Israel and Rome. These are the suzerain vassals. It was quite common then for earthly kings in power over lesser nations to summon the key subjects or kings from other nations to come and pay tribute. And the suzerain, the king over other kings, would implore the subjects who were the vassals to carry out his will and to obey the commandments. But there was an arrangement of protection that was given as well, that they worked together. In this case, Yahweh was the suzerain, the king, while Israel, the vassal, would carry out the word of God and obey, in fact, carry the very message of God to the nations. Yahweh, God, would, would care for and he would guide and protect Israel when he needed to. Therefore, the ultimate and high king of kings has summoned Moses. He said, you're going to be my spokesperson to these people. You're the spokesperson then, Moses, to the nation. And it's all driving to a greater rule, one that could demonstrate God's divine rule over the whole created order, over all things seen and unseen, including all of mankind. Yet through this one people, God chose to make known to them a divine revelation through the giving of the law. And it's here that the modern Christian can then find a bond with the ancient Hebrew people. For we have received this divine revelation. We now get to hold and to possess this divine revelation that the people of the promise were always the people of faith who received it and said amen to it. And we would learn that the flesh was of no use. We were to be the people of faith. Well, the great works of God that he had in store for the Hebrew people as they went forward in time are reminiscent of the great works that God has in store for the church since before the foundations of the world, as we learned in Ephesians 2.10, that we are the ones who have nothing to boast about, just like Israel, the least of nations. The ones who have been saved by grace and through faith and not of our works, just like Israel, when they were delivered out of Egypt, these are the works of faith that we are to now walk in. We are the continuance then of spiritual Israel, God's messenger to the nations. But to establish his law in them, they would have to hear and obey. And God reminded them, as he would do many times, that he had delivered them from the hand of Egypt, their bondage. This is the second point under our second main point that God tells them of his historical deliverance he said in verse 4 you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians how I bore you on eagles wings and I brought you to myself and, and it's right actually for God to boast in his works that he has done these divine works the Hebrew people had absolutely no say in their deliverance they did not choose the means of their deliverance 
nor the hour, nor the day, nor did they possess any power to change any part of their plight. But God in his mercy granted them mercy. And upon Egypt would fall the ten plagues, including the death of the firstborn over all Egypt, thus securing the freedom of his people until Pharaoh would have a little change of heart and send his army, and it would cost him his army in the sea. And we must notice the testimony of the Lord that is that of a mighty, powerful eagle swooping down and lifting up the nation. Not simply to deliver them from their enslavement so that they could wander around aimlessly as a free people. That's not why God has delivered them, but to solidify them as a holy nation under God's care. The suzerain, their great king and God. And in continuation and fulfillment of the promises that he had given earlier through the Abrahamic covenant. Decades later, Moses would remind the people as they would be set to enter into the promised land. Deuteronomos, tell them again the second law. That's what that means, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomos, tell them again the law. And Moses would sing a song in there at the end of Deuteronomy in chapter 32, verses 11 and 12, a very lengthy song. And he remembered this saying, God lifting them up on eagles' wings. He says, like an eagle's this. So this is a song. I'm not going to sing it for you. You can ask Moses when you meet him, okay? Sound good? Church, amen. All right. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, the flutters, I think I could carry the tune. I just, I don't know. <laughs> that flutters over its young. It spreads out its wings and catching them, bearing them on its pinions. The Lord alone guided him and no foreign God was with him. Now for all time, the Hebrew people were to remember them, these mighty acts of God. The one who delivered them, the one who made them, made them a holy nation unto himself. They were drawn away from slavery, but they were drawn to God, by God, and for God. And just as sure as the nation was called and drawn by God, so too each one of you who now believe upon Christ is called by God and drawn by God out of slavery to sin to be set apart unto Christ. There was a greater slavery then that God would have to deal with than that of their slavery and the bondage to Egypt is the power of sin. It wields its power in the flesh of mankind. And the laws that God was about to give them would do something. It would actually cut into them and it would expose in them the depravity and inability to fully keep the laws of God. And not even Moses could escape this high holy standard, this truth. You know, after Moses recited this beautiful and godly song as a way of remembrance to the people, there in Deuteronomy again, 32, verses 48 to 52, we read these words. That very day the Lord spoke to Moses, Go up this mountain of the Abarim, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, opposite Jericho. Take a look, Moses. View the land of Canaan. View the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the people of Israel for a possession. And I would have you note the next two words. And die. Die there upon the mountain, Moses. Die on the mountain which you go up and be gathered to your people. As Aaron, your brother, died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. And here's why. Because you broke faith with me in the midst of the people of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. And here's why again. And because you did not treat me as holy in the midst of the people of Israel. For you shall see the land before you, but you shall not go there into the land which I am giving to the people of Israel. I don't think God was killing him as the punishment. It was the, you may not enter. His time on earth was done. And while it may seem harsh to us that God is holy and he will uphold his high holy character and from his high holy character comes his perfect sense and is perfect in righteousness and in justice. God had to deal with Moses and to not do so would violate his own nature. On this day in Exodus 19, it was the very same high God of heaven who was preparing himself to come down.
be near the people and to dwell in their midst, and His name would be holy among them and among the nations. We see a seriousness then of being in close relationship and proximity to God and His holy nature that has never changed and cannot be changed. And I would have an application question for you here, brothers and sisters. Do you uphold God as holy? Now let me ask it to you this way, perhaps. Do you say you uphold God as holy, but in your living, do your reflections actually reflect His character or more that of the world? And it can hurt. It can cut us when we ask these things. Maybe you're struggling with what you believe here. Maybe confess here, but live it out in the flesh. And I can only tell you, brothers and sisters, that we are to learn to abide with Christ, to be trained by God to look upon Christ in His perfection and not to go for the ideas of sinless perfectionism, but to go, God, in my weakness, then show me the better way. Teach me, O oh God, that I might live rightly before you in ways that please you. Because we know we don't always live that way. Therefore, we see a very serious God reminding the people of a very serious act He has done, and therefore He requires a very serious response. And I believe... There's also much required of us in the response. It's the third subheading under that second main point of our sermon today. That God calls the people to an obedience that will precede a blessing. In verses 5 and 6 we read, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And we must notice the conditions of the covenant and their obedience in keeping them, or the Lord they, that they were required. This what the Lord had commanded to them. Only then would they live in the blessings if they said amen to this. These were the terms that God gave, and not one of the terms was negotiable. So if you'll do it, then I'll do this. But that's it. You take it all or nothing. Quite literally, then, men are obligated to obey the words of God given in the Ten Commandments. And here's why. They summarize the very moral law of God. They reflect His character. How much more then should Israel, who is with God, then obey these commandments He's about to give them as they walk before the nations? These laws, these ten that He'll give them, are preeminent. And, and God gives them subsequent laws, civil laws and ceremonial laws, but all of those laws find their basis and root in the character of God. And so they all point some way through the Ten Commandments that God will give us. Our confession of faith says it this way, that the moral law, these Ten Commandments, requires obedience of everyone, both those who are justified as well as others. This obligation arises not only because of its content, but because of the authority of God the Creator who gave it. And nor does Christ in any way dissolve this. Listen, nor does Christ in any way dissolve this obligation in the Gospel. He does not. Instead, He greatly strengthens it. And if a person tells you, you know, it doesn't matter. As long as you got the blood of God, blood of Christ covering you, it doesn't matter how you live after you become a Christian. If you hear anything like that, that you can know you're speaking to a liar and a deceiver. 1 John 2, verses 4 to 6. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him truly, the love of God is perfected by this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides with him ought to walk in the same way with which he walked. What a blessing it would be if we obeyed just the Ten Commandments. What a blessing that would be for us, right? We're not justified by our keeping. We're not justified by our keeping of the moral laws of God. We are justified by faith. And neither was Israel. We're justified by grace through faith alone, just like Israel. And if you recall, in the day of their deliverance, they had received the word of the Lord. Slay the lamb. Paint its blood on the doorpost. And you know who was saved? Whoever slayed the lamb and actually believed the word of God and brushed it over the door and stayed inside when the angel of death descended upon Egypt. That's who lived. Those are the ones who lived. The ones who believed and obeyed God. They were delivered. 
Yet we are obligated, not for justification, we are obligated to obey God's moral law, as is all humanity, because as I've said several times, they reflect God's high and holy character. He is our creator, and therefore we must keep them and obey them. Listen, we don't need, you don't need to have a Sunday school lesson to know that murder is wrong. We know that it's wrong. Almost every righteous society or good society would say murder is wrong. When we fail to keep God's moral law, we sin. Every time we fail to keep God's moral law, we sin. And our sin is against God. That's where the sin goes to. For the Hebrew people, God promises them a great reward for their obedience in keeping faith in the covenant. You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. You see, it's God who made them a holy people. They were not a holy people. So he set them apart and made them a holy people. They were captives. They had already been set apart, but they had now been captives in Egypt. And God delivers these people and brings them out of all of Egypt and said, No, you are indeed mine. What I said to Abraham, I say still, by my power and might, I bring you out by my hand. And they're a treasure under God because he's given him the title of his people. That's what makes him a treasure. He is their God. God repeats the saying to Israel many times throughout the Old Testament. And this, this, this saying, Shane, it's a shame. The saying should take your breath away. And I would say, don't you wish that God would utter this over you? That you would be his holy treasured people? Three times in Deuteronomy, the Lord reminds them, for you are a holy people, holy to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples that are on the face of the earth. Oh, that God would say that to us. Psalm 135, 4, God asserts it again. Malachi 3, 17, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. And I asked you, didn't you wish God would say such a thing over you, beloved in Christ? God has indeed said such a thing over you. For what began with God and the Hebrew people was a great blessing to the Hebrew people. But the Lord did bless Abraham, who did not hold back his son Isaac from God. If you recall, we know the story, Abraham binding his son at the request of the Lord, putting him there upon the altar on the mountaintop, raising the knife. And the angel of the Lord said, do not lay a hand on the lad. And there in the thicket was a ram. And God said, because you've done this and have not withheld your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And here it is. And in your offspring shall the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. God had always set Israel apart in this sense. And it is those who are of spiritual Israel that live in this blessed care and love of God. And God has said such a thing about us there in Titus. In Titus chapter 2, 11 to 14, he said, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. That doesn't mean every person. It means all the people groups. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. God has said it over you, brothers and sisters. What a beautiful and wondrous work of God. The light of God coming through the nation of Israel. The salvation of God then coming to all people. And look what it is that God has done. Where we once lived in lawlessness, we have been redeemed from our lawlessness. And here's the blessed words of the Lord. He says, you've been made a purified people for his own possession. That's you, beloved. And he makes us zealous for good works. And because he does this, I say then that he is a God who is worthy of all honor and praise and glory in our lives. 
God set the ancient Hebrew people apart that they should obey the commandments of God. And there was a blessing for them to live this in obedience to God. And though we'll study the Ten Commandments in the, in the few weeks to come, even today, if you think about it, civilizations that embrace the Ten Commandments of God as the basis for moral living, well, it's a blessing to their nation. And I think we can see the effects of it when it's removed from the courthouses, right, church? We can see that trend started a couple decades ago. It hasn't taken long to see the downfall, the moral downfall of a nation. These laws that reflect the high holy character of God. Yet the law was given, and as we know, Israel as a nation was unable to keep them. And so they would disobey the Lord and forsake his commands. And I'll have you notice that God does not relent his promises to Abraham, nor nullify any of his covenants. If you think about it carefully, and I, and I wish we, we would and remember, it's such a blessing, the commandments, when we study them, each one of them, are there one that we, that we wouldn't want to have present in our lives, that we wouldn't, where he says, you shall not, and we say amen to that, because if we go the other way, we start to see destruction then come into families and in communities. A.W. Pink noted that God dealt with Israel on the ground of the Abrahamic covenant, but from Sinai onwards, he deals with them nationally according to the terms of this covenant. And he did deal with them quite differently and in ways that we might think of as harsh, but we have to remember that they weren't chosen because of their power and size. In fact, they were the least of the nations. God was revealing his power through the least of the nations. They were chosen with the mission to walk with these words of God and they were required to obey this covenant. They were his nation of priests. They were the beloved of God. And they were to be the mediator of sorts between God and the other people of the world. Messengers of their king of kings. And they failed at this mission. I have another application. Let us not fail at our mission, church. We have a mission. We are to carry the word of God to the nations. Peter told the believers many centuries later, 1 Peter 2.9, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We, we can't miss the similarities there, can we? This is the very word of God repeated. This is how Peter sees it. This is you, church. This is how you're to continue. God called both the Jewish and Gentile believers out of darkness and sin. God delivered both the Jewish and Gentile believers out of darkness. He made a royal priesthood, each of them, a holy nation, a people of his own possession. And it should sound very much like the word given in Exodus 19, because it is that. God sees us this way, and we are to carry that message forward. Please, church, let us never fail in carrying the message first in our homes. That's where we need to carry the message in our homes. Here, you know, there are churches that are failing to carry the message even in the church when they gather together. So you know they're not doing it in their homes. And then they fail to take the message and care for the lost there, not even in their own communities, let alone the nations. We have Daniel and Matt Jensen in Thailand. And I'll get a report from them next week. We met Hot Neil Perez a week or so ago and the people in Cuba. And, it, and the word needs to be preached there. And the word needs to be sent here. And it needs to go there. And it takes people who are going to go, yeah, I might actually go do that. I might, yes, my family, we might live there. Or we might train our children. And we love our children. But we're going to pray over them and send them to a foreign land that they might proclaim Christ. That's what it takes. It takes nothing short of that. People going in the name of Jesus Christ. The people, here's the fourth part of our second main topic, that the people agreed to the covenant that they would obey. They agreed to it there in verses 7 and 8. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord commanded him. And the people answered together and said, All the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. Not only did they agree to do it, but they would agree time and time again when they, were when they were reminded, we will do all the Lord has said. 
We will do all the Lord has said as recorded in Exodus 24, 23, Deuteronomy 5, 27, and Deuteronomy 26, 17. But ultimately, they would fail. But the covenant of grace would continue moving through time. We ought to pause for a moment and carefully consider that the people that day, the ones who so readily said amen, were unable to keep their word and they did suffer greatly for it at times. We might wonder, God knowing this is going to happen, why then did he still give them the covenant? Why did he do that? Well, it was the grace of God that he did. And I believe that it was to expose to the world the message that mankind, even God's chosen people, are unable to break free of the bonds of sin apart from the greater works of God in his Son, Jesus Christ. That's what it's going to take for that to occur Israel would look forward to the one called Messiah, their ultimate deliverance. And on this side of history, we look back to the cross and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his great work and in the internal and or the external and the, this overarching covenant called the great covenant of redemption. And so Moses, having reported back to the Lord the people's response, God then had his own response. And I'm only going to teach the first part of verse 9 there. It's an ominous response. A fearsome coming of God in a thick cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud. You know, this is God veiling himself. That's what the cloud is. I'm coming to you in a thick cloud. And he does this for the benefit of the people. That's why he comes in a thick cloud, a veil of sorts because of the overwhelming glory of God that emanates from his high holiness. It would overwhelm and perhaps even kill the people should they see him in his full glory. God is the one who, according to 1 Timothy 6.16, dwells in unapproachable light. And if you recall, Moses, he desired to see the Lord, but, but the Lord hid him in the cleft of the rock, covered him, and as he passed by, only then could he looked upon the Lord. The Lord told him, man cannot see my face and live, Moses. And so he hid him, Exodus thirty-three twenty, Isaiah 6, the prophet taken up to the throne room of God. And there the prophet saw the Lord, likely pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, according to John twelve forty-one. And the word given there was, was Adonai, not Yahweh. And in any case, what Isaiah saw was the Lord, not his face. But he saw the train of the robe filling the whole temple, the throne. Ominous was the scene that there were angels covering their feet and covering their faces and flying with two of their six wings. That they would not look fully upon the Lord. Smoke rising and the foundation shaking as they announced, holy, holy, holy is the Lord and all Isaiah wanted to do in the moment, you recall this church, we've heard it many times, he wished he could just die. He wished he could just fall down and be, he was undone, he was exposed. That's all he could see was two things in the moment. The high holiness of God and the absolute depravity of his soul. Of course, God purifies him. But had God not veiled himself in the thick cloud that day, the people would have immediately been undone had they looked upon the Lord. They would have all wished to die, and perhaps they would have, and they would have at least thought the very two same things, how holy God is and how unclean they were. They would have been overwhelmed and paralyzed. In a sense, we see that the people with Moses that day, when God spoke, were overwhelmed. Later, after he gives the Ten Commandments, in Exodus 20, verses 18 and 19, we read this. Now when the people saw the, sun, the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood afar off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. It wasn't simply the power of God's voice or the thunders and the lightnings that overwhelmed them. It was the absolute truth and certainty of God's word as he spoke these words aloud to them and the people who heard them were immediately condemned by them, depraved and guilty as they stood there and heard these words before the high 
and Holy God imagine standing in the crowd that day. If we were to hear the thunder word of God and his voice remind us of his moral law and how we have broken it so many times I have no doubt that this congregation would fall down and be undone before God we would think the very same thing terrified and stricken with grief but God came in a thick cloud and his voice would thunder and he gave us the ten commandments because they were about his high holy character and there for all the world. As we close, I want us to take away from this ominous scene with God, who at, he, at this point in verses 1 to 9, he hasn't even given them the law yet. And in his preparation of the people, we see that already the matter is very serious. That already there's a high, the highest levels of reverence is being established for the one called God as he prepares them to receive this word. There would be fear in the people and the high holiness of God would be upheld. This is God preparing his people to receive the law, to make them ready to receive his covenant. And he's giving it to them in a very serious manner. And if he were like this as the law was given, how important then is it to obey what God has given? And in these laws, the Ten Commandments, as we'll learn next time I speak on this in two weeks, they are universal. And all who name Christ, far from being outdated, far from being unhitched from these, all who name Christ are to believe and to obey God's word given in the Ten Commandments. They are his moral law, and we are to obey them. Amen. And let's pray, church. Father, we receive your word albeit a bit terrifying, albeit the scene quite ominous, it is your word and it reveals your character to us. Father, I pray that we pause, we take stock of our lives. We have a healthy and ongoing reverence for you, Father. I pray that that would hold to the people here in this congregation, that we see you for who you are, O oh God. I thank you for your mercy and your grace that has been given to us, Lord, that we're not justified by the keeping of the moral law, but that we show our love for you, our great God who has delivered us from much. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.